All right, I'm early, but uh, checking in. Not exactly. Um, this is the testing portion of the program. And then at seven o'clock, we'll go officially live. Mr. Klaus, hello. How do I look? It's appropriate. Am I good? Kind of dark. But I'm officially in front of the library and I don't know. Best I've got right now, yeah? Let me adjust the gorgeous. Thanks, bro. <clears throat> fighting whatever bug is I'm fighting, so my voice is not on top of its game, but um any issues, any uh, anything I should be aware of. I should probably pull up the questions and stuff that you sent. You do that. Okay. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Hi, Brian. Hi, Puff Up. All up. Good. I could. I can clearly read, so that's good. Now all I have to do is be coherent and answer in a manner uh, befitting my reputation. We might copy paste some questions from others in this chat so they stay more. Yep. That would be awesome if you could do that from your end. I'd appreciate that an awful lot. I will help uh, keep me straight and not not miss much. Um, we'll see, huh? Anybody have an unofficial question they want to throw out before we get into the actual stuff? Hope you're all staying safe and um, taking care of yourselves. I'm doing my best in my little studio apartment. Here in uh, Hollywood, California. Hi, Martin. I say, sir, you have an inspiration to me both. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, I really appreciate that that you have found something of value in my art, in my performance, and in my in my life. Um, I, I'm going to tell you that simply from my own, um, uh, the makeup of who I am, uh, praises like that are very difficult for me to read because uh, I see all the warts and I see all the scars and I see all the things that I do, uh, that I do wrong. Um, I, I do understand that, that the work that I do does reach some people and, and touches some people. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, so thank you very much for those kind words. They mean more to me than I can express to you. Um, just know that it's uh, uh, it is somewhat difficult to to receive um, those kinds of things. Thank you very very much for that. Well, we all want to plant something that outlives us, right? Maybe I've made a good difference in a couple of people's lives and 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 uh, allowed them to enrich their lives more. Um, through the work that I did. 
uh, congrats on, on, uh, on your journey and, uh, and then the stories you tell. I'm glad, um, it's, it's a privilege to have been a part of it. You know, it just really is. I'm very grateful for the, <laughs> for the road that I'm on and for the things that, uh, that, uh, uh, my whole life experience and everything that it, uh, that it entails, even the bad parts, you know, play a, play a, play a role and, and, uh, are important. Nine minutes. Mm, feel like Black Friday. Except I don't think there'll be that much of a rush. Uh, well, we got nine people in the room. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, I want it to be. I want it to be busy. Naturally, I want people to to, to come and seek it out and, and get something out of it. Uh, I hope people get something out of it. But I, I also part of me doesn't want it to be that busy, so that we miss people or so that questions, you know, breeze by. Ah, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Um, uh, in this grand experiment and being the first one to try it out so we can learn what not to do next time. I, uh, I attempted to not watch the news today and failed. And so I'm, a, uh, I'm in, a, in, a, in an odd state of uh, disbelief and, and uh, indignation. So... Ditto, sir. Very glad we met. Um, quick question for you, Mr. Klaus. Um, on my monitor and what I'm seeing here, I seem I seem very dark. Uh, it might be because of the shirt. It's gray. It's not black. Uh, but from from my point of view, it's it's a little dark. Is that an issue for anybody else out there? Um, I mean, I, it's it's going to be mostly talking. There's not there's, there's not going to be. Uh, details and in, 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 you know and in, in, in stuff, but but if it's too dark for someone, I mean it looks good to you. Cool, 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 cool. How's your stage persona changed over the years? I've gotten older. Um, I've my my worldview changes as everybody's does. Um, I'm going to save. I know that question is going to come up again because uh, George, somebody else asked it. Uh, asked it uh, in the in the preview question, so I will be addressing that. But I'm going to save the meat of that particular question till after seven, when you know when we officially begin. Uh, the the short and simple answer, uh, before more details, is uh, as my as my perspective on the world matures, uh, it changes who my uh, what my stage personality comes out as. You know. I'm not the same dude I was when I was 35. I see things a lot differently than I did when I was 35. Um, it's a cliche to, to look back and go, you know, people say, if I knew then what I know now, how things might have been differently. But I wouldn't know those things had I not lived through some of the things that I have. So, but I'll get into that more. Cool. Lighting is okay. Awesome. Good to know. Wouldn't want anybody to miss my pretty face. Don't know what the guidelines are or what uh, I'm going to assume this is a corporate clean kind of a program. So I won't use, I won't use harsh language. I might use harsh opinions instead. We have a question from the audience. Are we ready to be, you want to go ahead and start then? Cool. Five minutes till I got no problem with that. Um, also kind of going on the assumption this is being recorded. Question mark. Um, if it is being recorded and people will be viewing it later, then coolio, I'll go ahead and start taking the questions and answer George's. We have a question from the audience. Rupert, how do you deal with the interruptions like a waiter taking an order in the middle of a table work? I never go to a table uh, before the order is taken. That's, that's, um, um, that's the number one thing. If you're working in a restaurant, if you're working... Uh, a, a corporate before dinner gig. If you are, if there is food going to be served and orders going to be taken, 
Uh, you avoid uh, interruptions like a waiter taking an order in the middle of table work by not going to the table before the order is in. Number one thing that's happening in the restaurant is they are selling food and atmosphere. The number one thing being food and booze. Um, your job is not to is not just to perform magic and promote yourself. Your job as hired by the establishment is to enhance the atmosphere of the place itself. Um, first order of business of the hungry customer coming in is to get his food order in. You're basically killing time between when the order is in and the order arrives. So to solve the problem of being interrupted by the waiter, don't go to the table before the order is put in. As far as dealing with other interruptions, Penn and Teller get commercial breaks. They, they uh, on their television show, when they're performing for the public via the airwaves, they have hard commercial breaks they have to take in order to pay the bills. The waiters are paying the bills. The, the, the interruptions that happen are just natural. You basically, you stop what you're doing right then and there. You pause, you take a step back if necessary, and you wait patiently for it to be done. Uh, once it's done, you step in, you step back up, and you... You either, if you have to refresh them as to what had just happened, you do that, but you progress forward from there. It's going to happen. One of the, one of the most frustrating things um, that you will find, uh, like it's especially in cocktail situations when you're working cocktail parties or doing strolling in cocktail, is that there are servers walking around uh, with hors d'oeuvres. And they, it is their job to stop in, to stop at every single group of people and offer hors d'oeuvres to be served. That's what they're there for. And it's going to come at the most inopportune times as far as your magic goes. Uh, what I do in situations like that, when I know it's going to be a cocktail party and they're going to be waiters serving hors d'oeuvres, is I will tell them, I will approach them and say, I'm going to be aware of you. I know what you have to do. And you're probably not used to having to deal with something like this. When I see you coming, I will nod an acknowledgement and I will come to a stopping point. And it, it'll be less than three or four seconds. If I see them approaching, I will put my own natural pause in and let them come in and offer food. You, you, you work with them rather than causing friction between them. Um, and it'll enhance your working experience and it'll enhance the, 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 uh, the magic experience for the people you're working for. That's, uh, that's my, mm -hmm. that's my answer to that. Thank you, Rupert. Um, let me see, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the thing. Um, there was a question Dave asked via Facebook yesterday. Uh, how, okay. How about talking about how you, how you and your character came about? What was the process and how did you come to your decisions? Did you involve other people? If so, what advice did they offer? I'm struggling to find my own character and finding the process extremely difficult. Yep. 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 Um, here's how I did it. Your mileage may completely vary, but here's how I did it and what was successful for me. I worked for years out on the street. I worked in a performance atmosphere, commando-like, people walking out, people walking away, practicing my craft in front of them and learning how to deal with different personalities. What worked for me was simply being myself. When you step in front of an audience, when you step up to a table, when you engage someone for a performance as a craftsman, as an artist, you are telling a story. You are presenting a point of view. Whether you intend to or not, you're telling them something about you. So I made the decision that everything that came out of my mouth and every gesture, uh, uh, wardrobe, um, uh, choice, everything that I did was going to be 100% on my terms and saying what I wanted to say, how I feel, how, uh, how I view the world, how I view the, the craft that I'm putting forth and what it means. Everything that I do and everything that I present and every script that I write is, is bottom line. What am I saying and how am I saying it? How is it going to be received by the people in front of it? And the character of who I am flows naturally from that. Um, I was also very, very fortunate. Um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, there's a group of magicians who get together. 
uh, once a week known as Slight Club, run by Scott Robinson out of Charlotte. Um, Scott came up with the concept of uh, a no-nonsense magic meeting, of, of basically taking routines and things that you're working on, presenting them for a group, a, a, a like-minded group of your peers, having all of those things torn, all the things you put up, it torn down to the bare bone, and then rebuilding it in a very, very personal, uh, very no-nonsense sort of way. Uh, all egos off the table, all egos out the door. Uh, you, you, you take what you put out of your heart and you present it in front of somebody who wants to see you succeed um, and have them strip all the fat and everything off of it so that what comes across in the performance is 100% uh, thought of. Everything, every move, every gesture, every, uh, every slight has been thought out and continually thought out and rehearsed and polished as you go forward. And I found that my personality and what I want to say came out naturally um, because of those things, because I strove to, to say what I wanted to say. Uh, current question, how did your character come about? Thank you. Did, what did I miss? Anything? Do you involve other people? What advice they offer? <clears throat> um, the, Scott himself, um, at the very beginning when I started working with this group of people, uh, asked me, what is it, what is it you're trying to say? And what is your superpower? Uh, as magicians, we are we are portraying a, a supernatural abilities. What is your superpower? What uh, what is it that that makes you what you do uh, able to be done? Do you do you provide power through your hands, and what power is that? And or or, or this that and the other. And after a long discussion, and after really really picking it apart, my superpower is time travel. I have the ability to go back in time or forward in time, pull memories or lessons from the past and present them uh, via via magical means, via the story means, and, and, and provide what I want to say based on my own experiences and, uh, and what I lived through. So my superpower is the ability to go back along my own timeline, uh, pull very tangible things out of it and present them in the, in the present. New question, Mr. E Magic. How long does it take? How long does it take for you to come up with a script you like? Uh, what is an example of fat nonsense that you cut out? How would you describe your character? What Tracy? Okay, I'm gonna. Okay, let me. I'm gonna go in the order they were asked. Rupert, how would I go about describing my character? I'm a time traveler. I am a. Um, I am a dapper punk um, survivor of the end of the 20th century. Um, I am a uh, I am an acolyte and a high priest of the power of love, and um, the uh, the Earth's advocate for storytelling. How's that? That's my list. Um, what makes me different from other magicians? You tell me, bro. You tell me. Um, what makes me different than other magicians is I am unafraid to be me. Jonathan Pendragon could not do what I do. I can't be him. I can't, I can emulate him. I can admire him. I can pay uh, homage to him as far as what he does and what he's created or who he's been. I'm using his as an example, but in reverse, he could not be me either. I am what sets me apart from other magicians is I am unafraid to be 100% me. I am unafraid to say whatever comes out of my mouth, whatever my heart asks me to say, it goes forward. Um, as far as practicality, what makes me different? I've been acting on stage since I was six years old. I did not pick up magic until I was 26 years old. So 20 years in the beginning there. I was doing musicals, I was doing plays, I was learning stagecraft, I was learning combat uh, choreography, I was a dancer, I was a singer, uh, I, I acted, I was an actor, I, I made my living as an actor and as a, a front man for rock bands uh, before I ever found the magic vehicle to do that and use that as my instrument. Um, I don't think a lot of other magicians, I know that a lot of other magicians don't have that life experience or that path that I walked before I ever came to magic or magic ever came to me. 
So I bring my experiences and, and everything that I've lived and all the studying that I did to the performance of performance conjuring. Um, that's what sets me apart. That's what makes me different. It's my path and it's my road and I'm presenting it as such. And a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also not afraid of, uh, of uh, making some people uncomfortable. Most magicians, most magicians, I'm not saying you in particular, I'm not saying anybody specifically in particular, most magicians rise to the height of their own mediocrity and stop and say that's good enough. It plays. If you ever find yourself uh, asking, someone asks you why that part is, or that why that bit is in your act, or, or why your performance is the way it is, or why you chose this particular trick to do, and you find yourself saying it plays, it makes them, it makes them laugh, it gets the reaction I want, you're not thinking enough. You've stopped, you've risen to the level of your own mediocrity, and you have decided that is the ceiling, and it's good enough. Good enough is never good enough. We are always growing. We are always changing. We are always evolving. Sorry for the for the Baptist in the audience to use that word. I'm sorry. Um, we are always evolving into something new. And your performance, your art, which is the act of taking your heart and shining a light on it, should be evolving as well as your own perspective and your own point of view. <sighs> People still here? Feathers not ruffled? I hope not. I hope your feathers are getting ruffled. Um, new question. How long does it take you to come up with a script you like? Years. Sometimes, sometimes I will, I will get an idea and the script will write itself immediately. Like, oh, that's what I want to say. This is what I want to do. In other cases, uh, the cylinder and coins that I do, for example, I first saw, uh, someone perform Eric DeCamps. I saw Eric DeCamps perform the cylinder and coins at the Winter Carnival of Magic in the mid 90s. Yeah, had to be mid nineties. And I fell in love with the plot and I learned it from the original manuscript and I learned how to do it. And I practiced it for years, never put it in the show because I didn't have a script that I liked. Now I could have done exactly as Eric did. And it's not against Eric because Eric is a genius and a fantastic magician. Um, but like so many other magicians, when, when, when presenting the plot of the cylinder and coins, they, they do it straight up the way the Ramsey did it. Here's the leather cylinder Here's the cylinder, here's the cork, here's the coins. And it's a it's a adventures of the props. It's a beautiful piece. I loved it when I first saw it. It did not fit me. It didn't work for the character that I had created. It simply didn't. I could have done it and it would have entertained them and it would have played, but it was not me. It was not, you know what? That should, that should probably be closer to me. It didn't play. It didn't play. It played. It would have played. It did not fit who I was or who I am. It wasn't until, uh, gosh, seven or eight years after I decided I wanted to do that trick, trick that uh, the specific prop that I use uh, accidentally fell into my hands, and then the script wrote itself. So as far as how long does it take the script, how long does it take for me to script, it takes what it takes. Sometimes it'll take an hour. Sometimes it's, it'll write itself that quick. Sometimes it could literally take years. There, there are routines that I have that I practice now that I, I will not perform because I don't have a good script for them. The answer is it takes what it takes. What is an example of fat nonsense that you cut out? The third cup in a, in a cups and bowls routine. I understand why there are three cups. I understand the philosophy behind be, in having three cups. I understand the history of having three cups. Uh, I thought three was too many for the typical street audience to be able to follow while being heavily intoxicated. It needed to be streamlined. It needed to be much more direct and less of a guessing game and more of a, of a you know, of, of what I would perform. So I, I, I took away one cup. It happened by accident. Um, somebody on the street grabbed a cup, a cup and ran with it. So I only had two to work with, but I found that doing a two cup routine rather than a three cup routine much more streamlined, less fatty, much more magical. And I still do that routine to this day. George Hunt, what role should comedy play in magic and what kind of humor do you aim for? <sighs> what role should comedy play in magic? 
comedy should play the the exact same role in magic that drama does, that storytelling does, that rage does, that nostalgia does. Um, comedy, the evocation of emotion is the performer's choice. What do you want to say? I'm going to go right back to that. What do you want to say? How funny do you want to be? Do you want to be a comedian or do you want to be a magician? You can be both. Some people are brilliant at both and can combine both things together at once. What are you striving for? Do you want to be funny? Do you want to be magical? It really comes down to your own particular preference and what do you want to put forward to your audience? Comedy will play that role, but what if you wanted to be dramatic with your magic? What if you wanted to be thought-provoking? What if you wanted to, to simply tell a grand story that has multiple different emotions that pull into it? So uh, comedy should strengthen the show without taking anything away from it. That's the role that comedy should play. Um, what kind of humor do I aim for? Everything from, from just spontaneous gut reaction laughter to thought-provoking. Um, I do a joke in, in, uh, my, in my close-up act, which is it's the Pringles can't act, and the Pringles can is sitting on the table, and I, um, the joke is that's face-up, that's face-down, that's face down next to the can like Elvis was. And that gets, bah, that gets a, a spontaneous. Actually, it more gets a, <laughs> oh, 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 where they laugh initially and then get horrified and back up a second. And I follow that joke up with, well, you know, maybe that's an old joke. Maybe, you know, Elvis is not a, I could have done an Amy Winehouse joke, but I have too much respect for her. She's like five years sober. And that takes a thought that doesn't, that doesn't get an immediate laugh. There's a deeper thought to that. And some people get it and some people don't. Um, so it, it, it's what kind of humor do I go for? What grows naturally out of me? You know, what I find, I go for the kind of humor that I find funny. And some of it's dark and some of it's, um, some of it's profane and some of it's just, you know, good old fashioned G rated dad jokes because I'm a dad and I told jokes. Uh, whatever flows naturally from you, George. That's that's the answer. Uh, Klaus, Hannibal Jansen, a magician, gave the advice, never trust your audience. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, okay. Thank you, Klaus. That, uh, that's, that's actually, yeah. Another magician, never trust your audience. No. Uh, I work for drunks, man. I work for sober people. I work for corporate uh, corporate executives. I work for uh, working people. I, you know, I worked on the street, and, and it, you never know who was coming from what or, or what kind of job they do or what their home life is like or what their background is. You know nothing. But you but you go into the you go with the assumption that they're grown ups, and they're reasonably intelligent people, even while intoxicated, um, and you put a lot of trust in them. I am of the opinion that if you do not trust your audience, they're not going to trust you and you'll immediately have friction between you and they have much more of an opportunity for heckling and pushback and people trying to trying to step in and tell other people how you're doing what you're doing. If you trust them and you approach them as a, as an adult, as a, as a peer, you're going to engage them on a whole different level than I'm trying to fool you with something. Trust them to follow you. So Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Klaus. That, that's uh, interesting. Very cool. Um, George, what comes first, the script or the trick? It, does, it, differs, it differs. Uh, sometimes I get the script and look for an effect to, to or an idea that I want to present, script it, and then plug the trick into it. Uh, there comes a point in the script where you have to have a trick to work around or you've got no script. You can write a script and maybe create a trick to fit the script. Uh, but more often than not, you're going to, you're going to come across the idea of here's a magical thing I want to happen. Um, and so in that case, of course, you work the script around that 
that effect. What's going to happen? Well, this is going to go from here to here. This is going to transmute from there to there. I'm going to read this person's innermost thoughts and desires. And then you, you put the words around that. Um, you cannot fully form the script until you know what the effect is going to be. Right. I mean, you really can't write everything out until you know exactly one, what you want to get across and two, how it's going to be perceived, how, you know, let me go back to this thing. Um, let me make this a little more uh, obvious. I'm going to go back to this thing. What's happening here? Um, is 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 the card changing from one card to another, or is or the card that was there disappear? Right? Did uh, did the did the King of Clubs uh, change physically into the Two of Spades, or did the King of Clubs simply vanish? What's the effect? What's it's the exact same move. It's the exact same uh, probably reaction. But what happened? Did that card fade away into nothing? Did I did I cause it to, to disappear? Or did I cause it to change into something else? Or did I get it to change places with a, a two that I had somewhere else? Was the two of clubs locked in a cabinet and you open the cabinet? Now the king of clubs is there. What happened? That's entirely up to you. That is entirely up to the performer, the artist, the craftsman telling the story. You decide. And hopefully you, you, uh, you communicate that decision to your audience. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Cinematic breakdown. What advice do you see? What advice do you see get told to every magician that you completely disagree with? What advice do you do? Oh, do you see get told to every magician you completely disagree with? Oh, well, I mean, I guess the strongest thing is, uh, well, the strongest thing is it plays. You know, like I said a few minutes ago, advice that I see other magicians getting. I have to think about that one for a minute or two. The thing that I, I strongly, the most strongly disagree with is uh, stopping, um, stopping when, when a person stops working um, on an effect because it plays. It, it plays, you know. Um, I think that's really bad advice. What advice do you see told to every magician that I completely disagree with? I mean, I see a lot of, I see an awful lot of, um, of magicians advising other magicians on this, you know, this will be the trick that puts you over the top. This will be a reputation maker. This will get you more work. I am of the strong belief that the show has to come first before you start seeking the work or the monetary uh, return from what you're putting forward. It really ought to be the show more than anything else. Some of the best advice that I got when I was just starting out, both as an actor uh, and as a magician, it came to me in two different times in my life. Uh, someone who I respect, two different people that I very much respect gave me the same advice. Number one, have a kick-ass performance. Number one, First rule of performing uh, and being successful is have a kick-ass performance. Do not settle for mediocrity. Um, have the best possible performance you can have today. Tomorrow, it should be better. It should be a little better. You should have walked a little further down your road before you engage in monetary return. Focus on the show. Focus on you. Focus on what you want to say. The money will follow. Success will follow. It just does. Okay. Um, how do you deal with these two types of hecklers? How do you deal with these two types of hecklers? A, drunks. Drunks want attention. Give it to them. Uh, let them have it. They might say something funny that you can put into your next performance. Uh, they want to be a part of it. If it becomes, don't be so married to your script that you can't complete what you're doing uh, with, you know, without wandering off of it. I see so many magicians, so many that are trying to perform for drunks that get so addled by the, the feedback coming this way that they, they don't, they're so married to their script. They don't know what to do when they wander off their path. 
walk with the stranger into the woods and see what happens. Get a new experience out of it, if nothing else. Listen to what they're saying, because they might say something funnier than you were going to say. Um, I have, a, because I've done it for years and years and years, I have a good way of judging how drunk someone is and how far they're going to take it. Uh, if I see they're going to push beyond what I want to happen, I can make it funny for a little while, but if I see they're going to push further, I'll just shut them down. Simply shut them down. I will stop the show, and I will look at them until they get uncomfortable. And then I will simply say, stop, quietly, not calling them down, not, not pulling all the attention or making them the object of ridicule. Just look them in the eyes and say, stop. If it happens a second time, I will say, stop, or I'm going to have you taken out. I'm gonna, you know, the show's going to end. You're going to disappoint all these people, and we're going to ask you to leave. And the third time I ask them to leave or have them escorted out or whatever. Um... But initially, they're having fun. You want them to have fun at your show, right? Your ego is not so huge that you have to be the funniest person in the room, right? I mean, yes, you're being paid to be there. Yes, you're being paid to entertain. Yes, you are the, you are the showboat. You are the showman. You are the guy in the spotlight. But are you afraid to share that? Are you afraid that this person might say something absolutely hilarious and let everybody else laugh with him, and then you write it down so it goes into your show that you say it next time, and you learn, and you grow, and you build, rather than saying the exact same script, the exact same way for the rest of your life, all the way down the line. Don't be afraid to play with them. They want to have fun. They came out to have fun. They are enjoying themselves and feel so confident and so open, they feel like, you know, being out. Now, if they're being a challenge, that's a whole other thing. Um, but just being drunk isn't a crime. And uh, I have a lot of fun playing with drunks. I don't consider them hecklers. I consider them inebriated humans. Smart people who openly point out often correctly your moves real time. Practice more. Practice more. Get better at the moves you're doing. Hide them better. Work on your misdirection. Work on your character. Work on the way you direct your audience. Someone smart pointing out your moves happens to me. 50%, 70% of the time, they're wrong about what they're, what they're calling out. Because I practiced and I'm good. and I know what I'm doing. Practice. You, you, you want to get to Carnegie Hall? You want to be the maestro? Practice at maestro level. Work on it until it can't be seen, until they cannot challenge you in what you're doing. If the slight you're using gets seen or you have visible, use a different slight. Improve on the slight you're doing. Practice. Somebody calling them out, they're an asshole. You're going to meet assholes. They're everywhere. They're freaking everywhere. And they really ought to know better. And they are, they are spoiling the time for everybody else. You go back to have a kick-ass show. Go back to... Your show is so strong and so rooted in who you are and what you want to say that the kind of people that are like that, that are trying to point out the simple, the, the, the trivial things, which are the slights that you're doing, they're important, but they're trivial to the show. If you need me to explain that, I'll explain that a little better later. It's you. It's the singer and not the song. It is the artist and not the trick. It is, it is never about the tricks. It is never about the slights. It is about what you are putting forward and you better be putting forward your absolute best or some asshole is going to call you on it. And what are you going to do? Yep. You're smarter than me. You, you figured it out. That's awesome. Can I keep going? Do you mind if I keep going? Feel free. Would you like a, would you like a flag you can wave when you see something happening? I need to learn. I guess I need to practice a little bit more. Are you enjoying yourself anyway? Can I buy you a beer? Be better. Be better. I'm an asshole. Sometimes. Uh, fun commercial time. Tell us about one of your projects. Hannibal working with hecklers is an amazing thing to be able to see. So many fun things come out. Right? The fun stuff happens when you just, you concede the floor a little bit. You go, okay, you got something you want to say? 
say, say it away. Go ahead. Do the thing. Talk out loud. I, I'll listen to you. I'll respond to you. I'll react to what you're saying. I'm more than happy to do that. Let's play together. I, I'm sorry to say I've seen my show. I've heard my voice for years. I know what's going to happen. The, the, the interruptions and the heckling and the playing with drunks, that's the part I love the most. I just, I thrive on that. I love playing with people in that fashion. I, I just, I just do. The show doesn't change for me. I've seen it. I know how it's going to end. Maybe tonight, because of something you said, it's going to end a little bit differently. And man, that's an awesome feeling when you can pull that off and it, and it comes back around to you. <whistles> Unbelievable. Projects I have working on, I am writing a book. I'm writing the book. I'm writing my my heritage book. Uh, I am I am sequestered and I am quarantined and I am isolated. I have no shows that I can go and do, and my performance doesn't. I'm my 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 performance, my live performance is immediate and intimate and does not translate well to the video screen. Uh, I could and I I may, but honestly, it's the raw unadulterated, live, sexy performance that, that I strive for. And I, I don't get to do that right now. So uh, encouraged by uh, Richard Kaufman, um, I have started compiling and putting together every move I have created, every uh, effect I have created, every routine I have worked up and created with the help of, of not only myself, but uh, the the crew from the, from the Slight Club years ago to... Uh, things that I heard on the street to the comedy clubs and everything I've ever put together that is uniquely me, all the tricks, all the moves, all the slights, everything is going into this book. It's everything up until this point. Uh, also, uh, a ton of stories that I've never told uh, that are going to be put in the book and everything that has happened to me along the journey that I've come along uh, on, a long way through, um, as well as anecdotal things about what it's like for a living performer to spend over a month now, over 35 days now uh, in isolation in a roughly 600 foot studio apartment in Hollywood, uh, having no human interaction in, in that time. Um, and that'll, that'll go in the book too, as well as my own philosophy about what magic should be in my opinion, the way that magic is, in my opinion, uh, why why I think the way I do and how I incorporate it into the performances that I do uh, every day, all the time, well, almost, you know, when, when I used to do it every day. Uh, that's what I've got working on. Uh, writing new magic, writing new things for when quarantine is over and I get to go back to illusion. Uh, I'm working illusion. I'm the resident bar magician at illusion magic lounge in Santa Monica. When I get to return to the magic castle, um, when life, uh, resumes, whatever the new normal is going to be. Mm, Hannibal books, DVDs, uh, and online content in the description support artists and creators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Please do support me. Um, uh, DVDs, dads, what are you going to do? George Hunt, conflict is an important part of a narrative. Yes, it is. Aside from danger and magician and trouble style effects, how can magicians add interesting conflict to our magic? Know where the edge is and don't be afraid to step right up to it. Uh, know your audience. Learn your audience. Study the psychology of, of working on stage and working live for people. <clears throat> know where that line is and, and don't be afraid to get right up on the edge. And once you have the experience and the ability, don't be afraid to cross it either. Not too far, not going too far where you're going to alienate the people you're working for, but to make them magic like art should at some level and at certain times make someone uncomfortable, not 
in pain, not offend. Well, offended, I do. I, I do offended. I, I, I do. I do offensive. Um, but I know my audience before I step across that line, and I know where I. Most of the time, I know where it's going to go, and if I don't, I take the chance. Um, take the chance to speak the truth. You want you want some friction. You want some conflict. Take a moment to speak the truth about what you believe and who you are and present that through your art. And you'll get tons of conflict. You'll get tons of friction. I mean, not for nothing. There's an act that I do. Now, I want you to remember who I am. And I want you to remember, uh, I want you to remember one, the, the, the funny guy on stage, the Hannibal, you know, loose cannon off the leash. You want a blue show? I'll give you a blue show. I'll, I'll show you. I will push your limits. That guy who lives in harmony with Hannibal, the storyteller and Hannibal, the, the elf boot dude, you know, the guy who does what, what has been referred to as the boob trick. I do a, I do a cards across that it, on the face of it, if you have someone were to describe to you what I do, sounds offensive and sounds misogynist and sounds awful. But if you watch it performed, it's very respectful and it's very, I get asked, I, I took, I cut it out of the act for a while because I thought it's no longer time for this. But then I had, um, I had people who I respect and trust and, and very conservative clients ask me to put it back in the show because it was just so funny. So that guy, the funny guy, uh, married comfortably to the, uh, the elf boot storytelling, uh, cylinder and coin guy. Um, I was going somewhere with that, uh, still causes conflict, still, still pushes the line between, you know, uh, I, I say what I believe. I speak the truth through what I perform. If you want to, rather than danger, rather than magician in trouble, try telling the truth. You want a good example of that? Uh, Pen and Teller, you know, especially their early stuff where they they portrayed the bad boys of magic who were revealing secrets to everyone and causes huge uproar and conflict in the magic world and in the layman world of people who supposedly love magic but couldn't see the truth they were telling through the characters they were putting forth. Um, tell the truth. Say something you believe in. Um, be convincing because you actually believe what you're saying. Get some conflict there. I hope that answers, I hope that touches on the the, uh, the the heart of what you were trying to get across. Tiny Boots are full of conflict, and it's a monologue. Totally is. Totally is. Uh, message retracted, and boy, I really want to... <laughs> I want to know what you said, because I missed it. Uh, Gladstone Beast. What is the craziest thing a spectator has ever done while you were performing? <sighs> so many. So many. Um... Performing in a comedy club, late 90s, uh, in the comedy club era days, and uh, the audience was not with me. They were just absolutely not. They didn't, they didn't like what I was doing. They didn't care for anything I had to say. And one of them uh, threw a full-ish beer bottle up on the stage and caught me right here, knocked me out, came out of the darkness. I heard, I heard the sound, this whoop, whoop, whoop thing that beer bottles make when you throw them, um, and it came out of the darkness, and before I could react, it caught me right there, and I went straight down to the stage. Uh, knocked me cold. Um, I had a woman in the castle uh, take her blouse off. Uh, just, uh, I was working, I was doing a, a, doing a late night set, and um, she's like, nothing gets to you, does it? I said, not really. And so she took her top off to prove that I could be gotten to. Um, that was Considering the, the place, it's pretty crazy. Um, uh, you know, as far as busking on the street, I had a gun put in my face. I had my table flipped on more than one occasion. Uh, I had people run by and steal the tip, the tip jar and run off. Um, a lot of stories, some of them be in the books. Oh, no, maybe the craziest thing on the street. 
uh, which is in, uh, I've told this story before. I think I printed it in Genie, in one of my columns of Genie. <clears throat> I had a street preacher uh, start making a circle around me in the crowd that I was in, praying for a bus to, to uh, run up on the sidewalk and kill me and everybody watching me, literally praying to Jesus, holding his Bible in his hand, walking around me in a circle and praying to Jesus that a bus would, would swerve off of the street and, and kill me and the people watching. Uh, he, he prayed to Jesus for cancer to take my children. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating either. Came up to, to, to tell me in between shows that I was a sinner and that Jesus would not, uh, would, would be disappointed in me and that I really needed God in my life. And we, we had a discussion, a very calm discussion. But when I started gathering another crowd, he got very upset, uh, that I was still going to perform my, my dark magic and take money for it. And so he started praying for the death of me and my family. That was crazy. That's probably, you know, apart from having a gun in your face, is probably the most frightened I've ever been um, in a situation because I didn't know what he was going to do next. I didn't know. I didn't know how the thing was going to resolve itself. But I was also resolved that I was not going to stop doing what I was doing uh, to keep from hurting his feelings. <clears throat> uh, love your cards across because you give the right. You give the choice of where they hide the cards. Right. It's 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 their choice. It's their. It's always as far as the roadhouse, which is the name of my cards across thing. It is always the choice of the women that I'm using, um, that I'm using that I have participating uh, in uh, in the card trick. It is totally up to them, and because I allow them to be themselves, and because I trust them as an audience, it, it, it works and, and it gets better and I improve upon it and they, they love me for it. It could be damaging, but it ain't, it just ain't new question. How'd you get to magic in the first place? There are other people out there that want to ask questions, right? You tuned in to ask something or you just love the sultry honey dulcet tones of my voice. How did I get into magic in the first place? Well, let me tell you a story. I did not ever have aspirations to become a magician. I was working um, in a family resort in North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. Uh, I was writing scripts. I was writing music. I was writing, um, uh, well, they had scripts and music for a family resort. We, they had an entertainment uh, program in this resort. Um and I was hired to write scripts for the performing troupe that was there and to take part. I was also an actor. Um, and we did everything from live theater to musicals that, that uh, we created to uh, puppet shows and, and a bunch of other things like that. Um, during one of those uh, script writing sessions, one of the things that I wrote down, I created a, a street performer a street hustler, a street character who was a magician. He was a street magician because I had seen one years before. I had seen a guy performing magic on the street. So I thought, this will be an interesting character. I'll write this into, uh, into this script. Um, nobody in the troupe knew how to perform any magic tricks. So I said, okay, I'll play that part. I went to the public library and I checked out books on card tricks, checked out books on magic tricks to learn how to do a couple of things uh, in order to be able to play this part for the script that I wrote. Um, and I, I put a couple of the two or three uh, tricks in there. Um, and then uh, the, we finished the play. It went really well. Um, I liked the character. It was fun doing magic tricks. And then the resort closed um, and it closed overnight. We literally came in one morning and the gates were locked and uh, because of mismanagement of management or some such something or other, the, the place was being sued and shut down and a bunch of us were out of work. Trying to find script writing work in Charlotte, North Carolina that would support a family uh, is difficult. So um, after a long discussion with my wife, at my then wife, um, I took that character from the play and I went out on the streets of Charlotte and I performed it for real. Um, 
thinking maybe I can make a couple of bucks here and there. And, you know, while I'm looking for another job or looking for something else to do, um, I can, I can do these magic tricks and make a, make a little bit of money to help feed my family. And it turned out I was really good at it. Uh, I was able to tell stories and draw a crowd and keep them interested and make money. First night I was out, I made $86. Never forget that. You know, people frame their first dollar that they made in business. I, I did that and I still have it somewhere. Uh, it was a $2 bill because in my mind, in my mind, when I went out on the street, I was thinking to myself, all right, yeah, keep the first dollar. This is part of your history. It's part of your, like the first dollar I ever made uh, busking and performing. And of course the first tip I ever got was a $2 bill. So none of the things you plan, right? Um, I made 86 bucks and uh, on my way home, I stopped and I bought diapers for my children and I bought food for the family and I put aside some to be able to pay rent. And I went back the next night and I went back the next night and I went back the next night and and 27 years later, I am working at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. And I'm working uh, as the featured bar magician at Illusion in uh, Illusion Magic Lounge in Santa Monica, and and I'm nominated for Close-Up Magician and Parlor Magician of the Year from the Academy of Magical Arts. Um, when I tell you that my art chose me, I mean that 100%. I wasn't looking to become a magician. It didn't interest me at all until it became everything. And from January 1st, 1993 to this day here, it, it has been more than my career and more than just my art. It has been a part of a defining uh, who I am as a person. That's how I got started in magic. <sighs> Rupert, five tips for crowd control and winning over an audience. All right? Have a kick-ass act. Have a kick-ass act. Have a kick-ass act. That is rule number one. Rule number one, the act has to be solid. It has to be engaging. It has to be fun. It has to be magical. If you're a magician, your act ought to be magical. It needs to be a good, better than good, better than mediocre act. Number one. Number two, pay attention. Somebody's talking, somebody's watching what you're doing, pay attention to where they're watching, pay attention to what they say, pay attention to what they're saying to their friends and their neighbors, as well as to you. Crowd control and winning over an audience. Be yourself. Project yourself. Predict, pr project what you believe and believe it wholeheartedly. If you are working for a live audience, Unless you have just written this character that is completely outside of who you are, and if that is the truth, then be that person and know what that person believes and know what they're going to, uh, what they're going to say, do, and react to anything that happens to come along. You got to live that person and be engaging with that. Um, uh, uh, create a spectacle. If you are attracting, is that what the thing? Winning over an audience, be a spectacle. Make it so that they cannot take their eyes off of you. Be interesting in what you're saying. Now, I'm not talking about wearing a, 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 a light up tie or, or a glittering bow tie or a, or a sequined jacket or, a, or, 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 or your costuming. Your costuming ought to flow from who you are and not what you're doing. But having said that, be a little bit bigger than life. Be engaged. Be, be interesting to listen to. Pay attention to what you're saying and don't be dull. Cut everything you're going to say in half. Edit, edit, edit all the way down until every word you say is important and, and what you have to project is important. What is that for? Of course, that all, that all you know, being engaged, being, being, having important things to say goes back to rule one and have a kick-ass act. Number five, don't worry about it. Don't stress over it. You're here for a purpose. You're doing this for a reason. You were... You're made to be in this place at this moment, and you got to believe that with all the faith you would put in, in anything else that has nothing to do with you. Life is a there's a there's a life isn't what happens to you. Life is how you react to what happens. It's the same thing with engaging with a crowd. 
It's not what they're saying or what they're projecting to you. It's how you're reacting to it and how you're engaging them uh, via all the other steps, right? Be yourself, be engaging, be, be worth watching. Just be worth watching. Don't do what everybody else is doing. If five people in the venue you're working at, Magic Castle, if five people in the Magic Castle are doing some version of Bill and Lemon, why the hell are you doing it? Even if yours is the best, even if it plays, even if it works well. But if 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 you got six performances, what do you got? You got three performance rooms. You got one is that's what uh, you got five different performers officially working at the Magic Castle on any given night. I'm just using them as an example. Your mileage could be you could have ten magicians in one town. If if three of them are doing Bill and Lemon, two of them shouldn't be. Why on earth would you want to perform an effect that somebody else in the same building, let alone the same city, is doing? Why, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you do that to your audiences? There's no reason. Don't be redundant. Don't, I mean, lay people already think we're all cut from the same cloth. You know, they see one bad magician, they judge all the rest of us that same way. And I, I'm pissed off at a couple of you because of that because it comes back to me and I've got to win them over because you gave them a bad job. Uh, be yourself. Do what's from your heart. You're smart enough to create stuff, right? You're smart enough to get around the problem. I do a Bill in Orange different than anybody else does on the planet. I do. But if I... If I were working the parlor and wanted to do bookends, which is my bill to impossible location, which I think is the best thing, you know, the best thing going out there because that's I, it's my baby. I made it, you know, and I don't know. I'm going to pick a name out of, out of just the ether, Arthur Trace. And I don't even know if he does the effect. If Arthur Trace is doing Bill to Lemon in the close-up room, I won't do that trick. I won't. It might be, I might be dying inside wanting to give that audience this, but a dollar bill coming out of a piece of fruit? Well, I use a kiwi. I don't care. Dollar bill coming out of a piece of fruit is a miracle the first time you see it. And if you see it again on the same night, somebody else doing a different version, not as good. Yours could be the superior version, but if they see somebody else do it first, it's just redundant. You're not a cover band, are you? Are you? Where am I at? Where am I at? Where am I at? Lost my place. Lost my place. Um, craziest thing did that. Coming to Magic First Place did that. Five Tips Traveling Tool did that. Acting background <clears throat> is probably hugely beneficial to your stage presence. Mm-hmm. It absolutely is. Should fledgling magicians take acting classes? Any recommendations? Yes, take acting classes. Uh, but you know what else? Uh, take acting classes, learn how to act, learn how to react, take, uh, take, uh, speech classes, how to speak in front of a group of people, you know, how to, to take, how to be a keynote speaker, take classes, go to, um, uh, uh, Toastmasters, uh, and practice standing up in front of people and talking without any props in your hands. Do go to like Taskmaster, uh, Taskmaster, <laughs> that's a, that's a different thing. Toastmasters, uh, take acting classes, take improv classes, learn how to think on your feet on the stage when when you don't know exactly where you're going with a particular thing. Take improv classes. Take, um, you know what? Take stagecraft things. Learn how. Learn about lighting. Learn about music. Learn about uh, speech and and then you know and doing that. All kinds of things. Learn from as many different arenas as you can and bring it back to magic. Um, Learn how to be a decent actor and incorporate that into your performance. Learn how to be a decent speaker and bring that into your performance and make that bigger than all the parts that it is. Yes, I recommend doing more than just learning new tricks. I I recommend that way more than just learning new tricks. Uh, It stimulates the creative part of your mind. Learn to play an instrument. It stimulates the creative part of your mind and allows you to get outside of the boundaries that are set for you. The more confident you are, the the, the easier it is to step over that line. 
And we love you. And I love you guys, too. I, I say everything that I do in love and in wanting to be helpful. Uh, Jones83, what would you say to magicians with performance anxiety? And I don't mean specifically approach anxiety. Take acting classes. Um, um, I, I, uh, I, I can stand right now, these days, right now, I can stand in front of people and I can perform anything. I cannot hang out with people I don't know very well in a crowd. I get claustrophobic. I get anxious. I get, uh, it creeps me out. It's just, just being around that people. Cause I, I'm not a big extrovert. I'm really, really not. Um, Practice will help with that, having confidence in what your hands and your voice can do. Um, taking specific classes like acting classes or speaking classes or or being comfortable in your own skin, standing up and talking to people. My, my, my advice is learn from someone who's done it. Take, take a, a course in, take higher education in every little thing. Yes, learn your slights. Yes, learn your craft. Also learn how to act, learn how to speak, learn how to learn how to project a thought without saying a word, learn how to get your, learn how to communicate, take communications classes, read literature, read stories that you're interested in and let that absorb into the whole mixing bowl of the creative process so that it comes out something that is uniquely you and your own experience. And you'll be a lot more confident on stage. Any thoughts on smoothly incorporating the company's sales script into convention work? No. Is no an acceptable answer? I have struggled with that for a long time. Uh, what The solution that I've found uh, is that I am delivering to them a kick-ass show. And if you study motivational speaking, it really comes down to there's a bare bones thing of four or five th things that people are interested in learning about salesmanship, leadership, uh, communications, all these things all tie down into um, you pick those things and you polish those things. And then you present to your client, to your potential. How is the question worded? Uh, smoothly incorporating company sales script, get the script way ahead of time. Um, and, uh, and learn what the, the salespeople are going to say and enhance that to fit yourself. Use their logo, use their branding, call attention to their colors. Wear those colors in the tie and the suit that you wear, or whatever you decide to wear uh, visually for your performance for that corporation. Uh, generally, they're going to, their product is the best or the quickest or the, or the strongest or incorporate your performance to hit the words that you see in their script. If theirs is the best, the strongest, the fastest, the, the least amount of trouble, the most innovative, you take those buzzwords and you put them into your own script, into what you're saying about what you're presenting in front of them. And you'll have a good starting point. That's, that's the best I can offer. Uh, I have, I long ago stopped trying to do that because the work that I get, that I get hired for from the corporations that I get hired for want to see me and want to see what I'm bringing to the table to enhance. <clears throat> They've they're already sold on me. They're trying to sell me to their, to their people and in turn retain interest in their own company. I hope that makes sense. Uh, the more, the stronger your character is, the stronger your performance is and who you are, the better it's going to be for the company that hires you especially in convention work or trade show work. You're creating the spectacle. You're being a part of the team, but you're standing out and delivering that message in your own way. That's the, that's really the secret. Be yourself. Thank you for your years of magic. Uh, you're welcome. When I blew out my back, became disabled and lost all perspective of what I was going to do. My family came first. I found magic two years ago, trying to rehab my thumb. And so I looked at your work, Ramsey, Richard Turner, who inspired me to keep going. Penn and Teller, a question, and so much more. No plans for taking this further, but putting smile up. You're welcome. I, I, the only thing I can say to that is you're welcome. Um, I strive to be honest. I strive to, to put forth something of quality and of value that it, that it, it reached you 
uh, David, David Murphy, that it reached you means more to me than I can express. Um, one's, one's, you know, goal uh, to, to be a part of history or to leave something behind oneself that lives longer than oneself. Um, I was given a gift and I, I see it that way. 100%. I have a gift. I, I shared that gift with you and now you are sharing that gift with other people and it enhanced and made your life better. What else could I ask for? I'm grateful that I was able to do that. You're welcome. But thank you for being there and accepting the gift. That's, that's the best I can, I can say to that. I'm a little choked up. Any of uh, Brian V any advice for overcoming severe stage fright and anxiety performing for strangers practice. <laughs> um, I, Brian, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, if, if I fall short in anything, it's that I don't know what that feels like. Um, I don't understand stage fright and I don't understand anxiety performing. I, I don't, I don't, I have no basis for that. I've been on stage since I was six years old. I, I was in the music man um, singing Gary, Indiana at the top of my lungs at my little six year old self. My mother, my mother, when I was five or six years old, decided that a gentleman ought to know how to dance. I'm getting back to your point. I promise a gentleman ought to know how to dance. So she introduced me and, and put me into dance classes. I learned tap jazz ballet ballroom as a very wee young man. There exists somewhere, I've seen it multiple times because my dad had a copy of it, uh, a, a film of our recital and 29, uh, 29 children cowering back against uh, the red velvet curtain, uh, going through the moves and, and doing, you know, what they had learned to do in dance class. And one little asshole right up at the edge of the stage, just just on it, just getting it and, and putting energy and and heart and doing the steps, but projecting his, his himself out to his audience as well. And somebody in the audience saw that and said, hey, we need a little jerk like that in our play. We need a little kid who doesn't mind singing Gary Indiana at the top of his lungs in front of people. And I was hired for my first gig. So unfortunately, I, I don't, I do not have an answer for how to overcome stage fright because I've never felt it. Are you sure that what you're feeling is actual stage fright and not more along the lines, and maybe I'm just I'm being redundant, maybe I am, but is it more of a feeling like, did I practice enough? Did I, did I put everything I could into it up until this point before I'm going out to perform for these people? Um, if the answer to that question is yes, then take a deep breath and step out and do the thing. If it is no, practice more, practice better, practice smarter. If, if you, I, I guess the, the question I'm going to ask you, Brian, is what do you fear? What, what, what does your fear look like? Yes, you're afraid to step out on stage. What do you think is going to happen? Are you going to screw up the trick? Are you going to forget your jokes? Are people just going to be mean to you? Because I'm going to tell you, the majority of people that you are going to perform for are really decent, nice, kind people. The vast majority of people are going to be nice and polite and allow you your time and allow you their attention. And they're not going to throw a beer bottle at you out of the darkness. You know, I earned that. I did. I, I asked for it. Looking back at my own behavior, there aren't any, it's not going to kill you. You know, uh, there aren't any black holes you're going to step into and disappear off the face of the planet. I failed more times than I succeeded on my way up. I got booed off stage. I had a beer bottle thrown in my face. I got robbed at gunpoint. I had, I worked on the street, man. I had people walk up and watch for 30 seconds and walk away loudly declaring how awful I was. Um, I don't know. Maybe please take this for what I, for the way I mean it, but maybe you need to fail more. Maybe you need to, to 
to fall down enough to where you know you got no problem standing back up again. Um, that's really the best advice I can give you as far as stage fright is, is try to try to pinpoint where your fear is coming from and work to overcome that. Don't be afraid to fail. That's you can't really learn unless you fail, unless you're face down on stage. Sometimes, you know, if, if I hadn't had all that experience, I, I wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be this dude. First week I moved to Los Angeles a little over two years ago, February 14th, 2018, 2018. I left my home in Charlotte and I made my way across the country to work here. Day one of going to visit the castle, I had someone get up in my face and, and, and tell me that I didn't belong there. You're too, you're too loud. You're too boisterous. You're too, you're too much. You need to pull it back. You need to be like the rest of us. Okay. No. I hope that answered your question, Brian. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't. I don't have a technique. I don't have a, a switch that I, I can tell you to, to do, except go out and fail and, and be embarrassed and learn that it doesn't kill you and that it's okay to fail. It's okay to fall and to learn and to keep walking the road. I did it. I came out okay. George Hunt, super specific question. Do you have any thoughts on the linking finger rings? What do you like, dislike about the effect? Have you found a version that suits you? Maybe one of my favorite tricks in magic is the linking finger rings. Um, uh, which odd because I don't like the linking rings. I don't like, I, I don't personally like uh, linking rings. Uh, I think the linking finger rings is one of the strongest effects in magic can be one of the strongest effects in magic. Um, I, I dislike the current methods. David Regal has a great method. His is the best I've seen. Personally, your mileage may vary. That's my opinion. David Regal's is the best I've seen. Uh, have you found a version that suits you? No, I have not. Um, I have the props. I have been working on my presentation for 12 years, 13 years. I have yet to find a presentation slash script that works for me. I know how to do it. I do it well. I've done it in cabaret shows. It's not part of my act. Um, because it doesn't fit me. It's not right for me yet. I hope that I'll get a script someday that'll come across that'll, that'll, that'll work for me and be different enough from everybody else doing linking rings that I can call it my own and be proud to present it. But right now I know how to do it and I do it really well, but I won't perform it professionally because it's not mine enough yet. That's probably the thing I dislike about it the most is that I don't yet have a presentation for it. New question. And this is going to be the last Steve spills. I've never seen Steve spills. I want to see Steve spills now. Um, this will be the last question because we got to wrap it up. It's been an hour and, and let me tell you everybody, I had fun. I hope you had fun. Uh, and, and, and as this continues, uh, I'd like to come back. Go ahead and put that out there. I'd like to come back and do it again. Uh, last question. What's something you strongly believe about magic that a majority of your other magicians would disagree with? Boy, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. <laughs> you might, you might have to, uh, you might have to ask them, um, what I do that they disagree with. As far as a statement goes, uh, I'm going to tell you that one thing I strongly believe in is it's not the trick. It's the person. A lot of people pay lip service to that, but then go ahead and do the same things that everybody else is doing. So you don't really believe it. Um, mm, it's not the trick. It's not the secret. It's not the props. It's the human being. It's the artist. It really, it really boils down to 
it is the artist. And, and, and I, I, I don't know that I could find a magician that would disagree with that statement, but they sure don't put it into practice. <sighs> oh, man, I know there's an answer there and a better answer than that. Strongly believe about magic. Oh, you know what? I'll, okay. Something that I strongly believe about magic that I believe that uh, the vast majority of other magicians disagree with is that magic itself is real. I believe in the power and the reality of performance conjuring. I absolutely believe when I, when I perform the routine and the effect that I am doing, I believe that it is real because it exists. If I have done my job, if I have put my art right out there on my sleeve, if I have taken my heart and shown the brightest lights I can possibly shine on it and put it into their laps, into the audience, and I do not have magic without having an audience. It does not exist without me having an audience or people watching what I'm doing. If it exists in their belief, if I, if I, for want of a better word, if I fool them, if I uh, douse them in astonishment, if I pull the rug of the universe out from underneath them for even a second and do my job, real magic exists in that moment. And I believe in it 100%. Like I believe in love. Thanks for having me. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, I hope I offended somebody. I hope I, um, I hope you take something away with it. I hope I live a little bit longer because of you. Uh, please support your local artists if you want to support this one. Uh, there are links in the description for here. My Patreon uh, uh, ongoing is uh, Magic Artist, patreon.com backslash Magic Artist. My Venmo is Magic Artist if you want to help me survive the pandemic and living in quarantine. I greatly appreciate you listening to what I have to say. I hope you got something of value out of it. And I hope to see you again. I hope there's love where you are.